in the region. The Shah is keenly interested in developments in two countries at the time. One was Afghanistan, the other one is Iraq. In both, he sees the rise of Soviet influence. In 1973, the Shah be believes that Dawood is essentially a Soviet uh, agent. And he suggests to Zahir Shah in 1973 that we will fly you back into Afghanistan, we will settle you somewhere in Afghanistan, you ask for Iran's help, we will send in a military and reinstall you in power. That's how far the Shah was willing to go to interfere in the domestic affairs of <coughs> Afghanistan to stop what he thought was a Soviet incursion. In Iraq, in 1972, uh, the Shah believes that the Soviets are making very important headways. The Soviets had put a plan together that would bring the Kurdish minorities, the Communist Party of Iraq, and the Ba'ath into one unit, one un national unit to govern. The Shah was very worried that this will mean problems for Iran. It will mean problems for the West. It will be the first step of the Soviet entering the Persian Gulf. Uh, again, to his credit, from 1959, the Shah begins to plan a military that can stand up to the Iraqi invasion. Up to 1959, Iran's military strategy is designed essentially by what is called the Zagros line of defense. This is a strategy designed by Eisenhower. The idea was that Iran should have enough power to hold the Soviet incursion up to the Zagros line, use the Zagros mountain, and by then, the cavalry will come to help. The Americans will arrive to help. So Iran needs just enough to stop the Soviets at the Zagros line. After 59, the Shah believes the next threat to Iran is going to come from Iraq. Remember, there was a coup. The monarchy had been overthrown, and Qasem had come to power. This becomes redoubled in 68, when the Ba'ath comes to power. The Shah tries to organize a coup in Iraq in 71. They clumsily miss the coup. They had as their agent a guy who was a double agent for Saddam. And before they even make a move, the entire coup conspirators, a group of 41, were executed by Saddam Hussein. Iran had put all of its money into the wrong person. But the, quest, the, port, the port, important point is that the Shah was trying to destabilize the rock. And in 72, again with the insistence of the Shah, there is a three-year program participated by the United States and Israel, both of whom joined rather reluctantly, less Israel, and certainly the United States was very reluctant. But they eventually joined in an operation, joint three-year operation, that sent <coughs> millions of dollars to Iraqi Kurds to help destabilize Saddam Hussein. If this interference in Iraq goes so far as Iranian regular forces entering into Iraqi territory dressed as Kurdish Peshmerga and fighting the Iraqi army when the Iraqi army was making uh, victorious uh, onslaughts. Uh, so the Shah was very keen in trying to have a friendly government in Iraq and try to have a very friendly government in uh, Afghanistan, and was very much trying to be the hegemonic force in the region. Uh, now, in all of these three areas, we see the Islamic Republic more or less trying to accomplish the same ends, but with one big difference. The United States in each of, uh, Iran in each of these cases is supporting forces that are anti-Western, anti-American, and in most cases, anti-modern. It, it is an effort to truly challenge, not just the United States, but I think even uh, more culturally important, to challenge modernity, to challenge the whole 
idea that Renaissance was a good thing that happened in the world and that the Muslim world must try to find some way of implementing some form of modernity in Iran. So uh, the ruptures are more in terms of the politics of what the US, uh, Iran is doing in these areas. But there are some continuities in terms of what the countries of interest are and who the contenders of this attempt are. The Arabs are very much uh, opposed to Iran becoming the dominant force in the region. Then, they're very much opposed now. Saudi Arabia was a key foe in Iran's attempt to become the dominant force. Saudi Arabia is very much a foe now. Bahrain, today, is almost repeating, but in a much, much bloodier form, and with much more potential devast potentially devastating consequences, the confrontation between Iran and Saudi Arabia in Bahrain in 1967, 1970. Saudi Arabia was funneling money into Bahrain to develop an independent Bahrain. Iran was claiming sovereignty over Bahrain. The sheikhs that were in Bahrain, the Khalifa, were very much reliant on both the British and the Saudis. And eventually, Iran agreed to a compromise where Iran would give sovereignty, give up sovereignty to Bahrain in return for the occupation of the three islands, the two tombs and Abu Musa, critical islands for the control of the Strait of Hormuz and of the Persian Gulf. Uh, so Bahrain was then an area of confrontation. Bahrain is today an area of confrontation. What has changed is the political dynamics. The structural similarities are, to me, uh, striking. Uh, uh, let me not, uh, I was going to talk a little more about the domestic situation uh, of, of the three issues that I referred to, but I think uh, uh, I'm just going to talk about one aspect of it and then try to answer questions, if that is. Uh, when did we begin? I asked for a watch, but I forgot. 4.15. Uh, so maximum another five minutes, right? Uh, one of the most remarkable things about the Iranian Revolution of 1979, to me, is the coalition that overthrew the Shah. It is a very incongruent coalition, if you look at it. It is a coalition of all the forces advocating modernity, different versions of modernity. Marxism is a child of modernity. Uh, Iranian Democrats, from De Khoda to the National Front, were advocates of uh, modernity. The Pahlavi regime, in my view, was an advocate of modernity minus democracy. They wanted everything in modernity, but they did not want democracy, which was a very serious problem. Uh, all of these religious forces, uh, from Ayatollah Naini in 1905 to Ayatollah Shariat Madari in 1978, there is a continuous line of religious forces, Shiite forces, that are trying to reconcile Shiism with modernity. Ayatollah Naimi writes this famous historic text that in the absence of Imam Zaman, democracy, constitutional government, is the best form of government for a Shiite uh, nation. Uh, a book, incidentally, republished on the eve of the revolution by none other than Ayatollah Talabani, who wrote a remarkable introduction to it, uh, which shows where he was standing in this debate. Taliban, he was very much in this line of democratic paradigm of religious uh, and Shiism. Uh, all of these divergent groups united against one of the modernizers, the Shah, and chose as their leader the most adamantly anti-modern uh, force on the political horizon. Ayatollah Khomeini had been very clear and categorical in his opposition to modernity, in his opposition to democracy, in his opposition to constitutionalism. Uh, in his first book in Persian, he, uh, he says, 
why would it be better to have a law composed by a bunch of syphletic men over a law in Quran?